uh, the investment dollars to set up their own smart grid. So call it uh, smaller utilities, municipalities, co-ops, uh, the ability to buy... Grid as an electronic grid, an energy grid? What um, grid Smart meters and the infrastructure necessary to get all the return on investment from smart grid as a service. Got so it. clearly b buying it on a per meter per month basis is really kind of the market that we're going after. What are the big things you're seeing? And this is an emerging trend, obviously, you know, clean tech, energy is a big, big hot button in, in today's society. Um, and technology through sensor networks and everyone talks about in our world and uh, you know the, the Internet of Things, what really we're talking about here is how, using the Internet and, and technology to connect to our lives. So how does that fit into all that? Well clearly one of the best ways of reducing the overall cost of producing electricity is to get consumers to moderate their own demand during peak times. Um, the return on investment is pretty well proven. Uh, it has all of those things that you're talking about uh, for distributed automation, uh, all of those kind of activities, but really it requires the internet to provide the feedback loop to customers. So from that standpoint, it really is bringing the power of the internet and networking technology to individual consumers to manage their own electricity spend. So where do you live? Which, which part of the country? I live in San Diego. So you're in San, it's not a bad place. I mean, La Jolla, I have friends there. It's gorgeous, gorgeous uh, environment. Um, California obviously is very sensitive to the energy. Right. Um, and is there any spots within the U.S. and or outside the, in the world that are highly sensitive to the energy smart grid? Is there early adopter regional uh, focus? Um, yeah, I, I think I think California is one of the the hot spots for it, mainly due to the deregulation that occurred and some of the uh, the. I guess, uh, problems that that engendered. Uh, there's areas of the country where there's very cheap sources of electricity and so they, and they have plenty of it. Um, you know, clearly in California, we're worried about having enough during peak times. So California is, is, is a big hot spot for this. And, cert and certainly the Public Utilities Commission in California has mandated that the big I investor-owned utilities like Edison, uh, SDG&E, PG&E, uh, put a smart grid in. So we, you know, Dave, Dave Vellante, my co-host is back. Dave, Dave welcome back uh, on the set. Thank you, John. Uh, Eric has got a smart grid as a service technology uh, EMC customer. So he's kind of like our Tom Peck of the day. So he's got uh, V Block, um, and we're just talking about the smart grid. We have uh, oh, 3,400 people watching. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the new surge of, of audience, 3,488 to be exact. Um, smart Grid is a cool application, Dave, sitting on top of vBlock, and, and it automates a lot of the energy consumption that users can, can keep. So the futuristic scenario is, I got my mobile device, I'm managing my utilities, watching my bill, I'm not pay, overpaying, I can program my infrastructure. Is that kind of an accurate view, or are that oversimplifying it? What's the scenario for the future use case? I think that's certainly one of the major use cases that is available, but clearly from a utilities perspective, it gives individual users at their home the ability to program how much of their electricity use uh, and, and gas and water, ultimately, uh, that they really want to use at any one particular point in time. Uh, the payback from a uh, uh, utility standpoint is they can also reduce their accounts receivable and bad debt. So you can set up through smart meters the ability to set up customers on prepay. That alone actually pays for a lot of the infrastructure. Dave and I, are, Dave and I were uh, talking about innovation and the sandbox of Silicon Valley. Obviously in your area in La Jolla, it's pretty well known for a lot of telecom and a lot of innovation down there. And SAIC is a known player in La Jolla and San Diego community. Um, so, so innovation is on top of mind, but a lot of baggage exists in IT. Um, Dave and I talk all the time about Oracle and some of the you know, flexibility issues around, agile issues around Oracle or lack thereof. Um, and things like SAP, which is more open, you got closed Oracle, open SAP. How do you guys look at those new environments? Because vBlock is really interesting because it allows you to work in a very open, new, innovative way in, in this culture. So what's your experience with the IT landscape to make this happen? How do you get to that innovation point? Um, well, certainly with a lot of the utilities that we're working with, they tend to be on the smaller end of the IT spectrum. Uh, often, you know, IT departments measured in the uh, tens or even the uh, single digits. Um, they really need IT help. They're several decades behind. Uh, 
Um, and from our standpoint, the ability to buy this as a service, you know, pretty much as a service appended to the end of anything is kind of the, the latest buzzword. Uh, but from our standpoint, it really provides a way of, of helping out IT in this instance. Um, a lot of the applications that we're using uh, are from Oracle. Um, you know, they have a meter data management system that is, is part of uh, our, our offering, uh, potentially, as well as other vendors. Um, clearly, virtualized? It is virtualized. Yeah. And, and, and really what we're talking about is having a, the ability to support large numbers of individual utilities with a whole bunch of different applications. You know, in order to put in a smart grid, you need a meter data management system, a head-end system. Often you want to supplement that with a customer information system, a GIS system, a workflow management system. All of these systems, uh, clearly the, the upfront investment to put them in yourself, especially for a small shop, is kind of uh, prohibitive. And so we're trying to address that end of the market. So these are Oracle database-based applications, correct? Or not necessarily? Or, or SQL. Or, or SQL, yeah. okay. So, yeah. so in the case of Oracle database-based applications, are you virtualizing those? Absolutely. You are, okay. And is Oracle supporting that or certifying um, it or kicking and screaming? Or? Kicking and screaming. Yeah, okay. So this is a common theme that we hear in our community right. and we've studied this a lot. We, we know that technically there's no reason that VMware and Oracle, they just work fine together, but Oracle, of course, wants you to use Oracle, <laughs> exactly. VM, and all that stuff. But so you have figured out how to configure Oracle for VMware, and it, it works great, we know this, um, and then it's on you to figure out how to work with well, Oracle, you, but so your customers don't see any of this, I presume. Correct. What do you, yeah. what do you think of the, uh, the Microsoft scenario? I mean, Microsoft is a big IT player, and, and uh, they just bought Skype, so we know, uh, we've been covering that like a blanket, uh, on the Skype video, so video is a big part of that new Microsoft scenario. Um, in your environments, is video surveillance kind of playing into this grid, smart grid technology? Can you Certainly that's part of the smart sensors you mentioned earlier. You know, the ability to actually uh, use that network, the sensor network that you put in place, primarily built on the back of smart meters and collectors, you certainly can use it for uh, surveillance uh, of your substations. You can add all kinds of applications on top of it. Uh, from a Microsoft standpoint, clearly, um, a lot of the servers run on uh, server uh, 2008, um, and so there's certainly a lot of overlap with what we do. And as I said, it's not exclusive to Oracle. I mean, we use a lot of SQL Server in what we're doing as well. So you guys are cloud, right? I mean, and, and let's talk about vBlock and how it fits into to cloud. Um, this notion of taking a single logical block of infrastructure to support applications across the portfolio, that's new. It is. Um, how does that change the way in which you look at organizing your IT organization and 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 the various roles? I mean, you, previously, right, you might have silos of storage admin, server admin, network admin. Is that changing as a result of this? Well, clearly, if you're buying it as a service, you have to be willing to outsource or at least have someone else run some of that. Uh, for the smaller utilities we deal with, they, they really can't hire the kind of expertise that they need in order to advance. And so they're, they're more happy to do that. But you know, what we're offering is really a private cloud on a shared basis, if you can think of it that way. I mean, it is really not a public cloud. Uh, all of our customers are telling us that you know, using the traditional public cloud vendors to store their data um, is, is kind of a non-starter from a data security standpoint. Certainly some of the, the Sony incident, uh, some of the other ones have, have brought that to a strong light recently. So we're offering virtually private, if you will, or dedicated private cloud services to each of these utilities, but using the vBlock on a shared basis. Okay, and so from your standpoint, um, are you organizing different than say a traditional, I mean you've got a deep background in IT. Mm -hmm. um, is it changing the way you might organize an IT environment or not necessarily? Well, we're, we're a traditional IT outsourcer, and yeah. so we certainly have all the traditional disciplines that you would expect from a traditional IT outsourcer. We're applying that best practice knowledge to this new environment and acting as an extension of the IT departments in each of these utilities. So generally speaking, they're looking at us to come in and provide best practices that allow them to accomplish things that they really could not do on their own. Okay, so wh what about, um we talked about security before. Um, that's interesting. You've got essentially a multi-tenant private cloud. Um, so how are you architecting security to deal with that? 
Well, a lot of the uh, smaller utilities we deal with are, are, are together in what they call joint action agencies. Um, and so they've already agreed to share data or aggregate data, um, but really on a, on a basis of very defined rules. So if there's a data warehouse where the data is aggregated, we provide very specific um, rules to make sure it's private to each client. So it, you know, it really is using the ability built into the database to segregate data uh, to keep it virtually private to that particular client. So, I mean, that's got to be on the top of mind for your customers. They must ask you about security a lot. Right. That, that's probably question number two after cost. So cost is number one? Yeah. Cost is still number one. So, But that's in your sweet spot, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. I mean, SCIC is known for cybersecurity. Uh, we do it for all the three-letter agencies, and we've applied that knowledge, uh, frankly, into this space uh, using some of our unique uh, technologies that we have. How about privacy? You know, you hear a lot about security, but you don't hear as much talk in the enterprise about privacy. You certainly hear a lot, you know, with the Sony hack and... And, and now that you know, you, you know, Google, Android, and iPhones are following us around. Um, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, aren't right. they? Um, uh, why don't people talk more about privacy? Is it just part of the security discussion, or is it is it becoming more important? Um, I think it is becoming more important, and I think it's still now just being addressed. I mean, the ability to use the data to understand what is happening. So, from a, you know, do you really want uh, you know um, a utility to understand your usage profile? Is there a benefit to that? Clearly, there's a benefit, and it's kind of a byproduct of the technology. But if you uh, were to provide that data to a police agency, a, a standard size house in a neighborhood that's using four times as much power as uh, every other uh, house of similar size in an area, could they be doing something like growing something illegal in there? You know, th there's all kinds of uses of that data. And so it brings up all kinds of interesting questions on privacy. And you're right, I think we've just scratched the surface on that. So this notion of a smart grid is interesting. I mean, it's getting a lot of play. Um, there's some uncertainties, right? No question. Um, and and um, but in the big grand scheme of things, there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of wasted electricity that goes off the grid, right? right. I mean, that is sort of the the big the big gestalt problem that you're attacking, I presume. Is that right? Well, the issue really is the cost of producing electricity you, today. That you really still can't efficiently store large amounts of electricity. It has to be generated as it's needed. And so what happens is there's base load generation with the big plants, and then they have what they call peaking plants uh, that provide, uh, I guess, a, a leveling out of the peaks. Um, peaking plants cost tremendously a lot more uh, to operate than the base load plants, and that's why you see tiered electricity prices as the costs go up. Uh, the ability to shift load you know, I mean, we've had these load shifting programs for quite some time where, you know, turn off the pool pumps, turn off, you know, electricity or cycle them for uh, air conditioning, those kinds of things. The big benefit to uh, a consumer is being able to shift your use to a lower uh, cost of use time interval. And so uh, Smart Grid gives the utilities the ability to do time of use pricing. So you can decide that I would rather run my pool pump at night. Today, there's no benefit financially for doing that. So you don't, but if, if you actually got your electricity costs in half for that, you would do that. Same thing for um, electric vehicles as they come on the grid. Electric vehicles that are being charged in, how do you incentivize customers not to plug them in as soon as they come home? which is the peak of the day around 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. Yeah, what's going to happen to the transformer when everybody plugs in at the exactly. same time? I mean, that's exactly not going right. to work, is it? Exactly right. <laughs> and so the only way to, to actually prevent that is to incentivize the consumer to make smart choices. And so there's in-home displays that show time of use based pricing, uh, allow you to program in advance using your computer, using the web to basically say, if pricing reaches this level, turn off these devices in my house. I mean, it gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility, but the benefit is that, is that you're operating as a utility, you're peaking plants less often. Okay, and that's, there's a lot of software intelligence in there that enables that, and then there's some infrastructure underneath it that, right. that allows you to respond quickly. Very much and, so. And this, I mean, we're, we've been, at Wikibon, we've been writing about this a lot. Um, you know, we've been covering this, the whole notion of this logical block of infrastructure and, and, and in terms of being able to support those new and emerging applications. Is it... Is it, in your opinion, 
you know, a dramatically different shift or is it more just sort of technology sort of bolted together? I mean, whoa. Um, Help I, us understand that. I, a I think bit. it is a dramatically different shift. I mean, for a utility that's used to operating with a single monthly uh, meter read cycle, usually with someone walking by or even a truck roll uh, where they're going down and, and actually using AMR devices, um, the amount of data, you know, this conference is all about big data. Uh, the amount of data is increasing hundredfold, the amount that a utility is going to have to deal with. Uh, utilities um, are, are very conservative organizations, and this is an explosion of data, and an explosion in their IT department that, frankly, uh, you know, they're, they're still trying to figure out how to deal with. So I, I think it's a paradigm shift. For us, as an IT outsourcer, it's just more of the same. It's applying the best practices that we've used for years with ERP systems uh, to a new mission-critical system, because we are touching a utility's most critical business process, which is meter to cash. So, talk about data. Um, your customers obviously own their own data. Mm -hmm. That's got to be pretty clear um, in your relationship with them. Um, are they... Or are you partnering, thinking about somehow gaining or uh, uh, extracting greater value out of that data, out of that database of information that's there? Uh, is that, is we're, that we're, too we're, far off, or no, is that something I mean, that is clearly is in the we're, we're not there to harvest it uh, and to make use of it? Uh, we're talking about ways of uh, helping them harvest it, right? Um, you know, again, these joint action agencies, uh, like in North Carolina, for example, Electricities, um, they will be able to use the aggregated data to make you know buying decisions from their large IOU uh, service providers that provide the electricity for them. Uh, most of the municipalities don't have their own generation, so they buy it from a local big IOU, um, and so they're they're definitely trying to figure out how to minimize their their peaking costs and those kinds of things. So there is a benefit of aggregating the data for the benefit of making joint aggregate decisions for these agencies. Right. Will, will you do that aggregation for them? We do. We'll have a data warehouse that allows them to do data analytics um, and to make good decisions based on the data. Not not just at the individual municipal utility level, but also at the joint action agency. But there's no, be no sharing between joint action agencies, if you will, right? Which tend so, to be state oriented. So was that? I mean, can you charge for that? It's part of the basic service. So the way we're pricing it is a, is a per meter per month basis, um, with additional for each new service beyond the basic, if you will. The basic includes meter data management. Uh, the head-end software, as well as an option to actually uh, amortize the cost of buying uh, and installing the meters themselves. Excellent. Well, SAIC innovating um, into the smart grid. Uh, Eric, it was great to have you on theCUBE. We appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspectives about, about VBOC, infrastructure, software as a service, the, the, the electrical grid, some of the challenges that customers are facing, some of the data opportunities that are out there. Uh, Eric, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you Thank for you. having me. Thank you thanks very much. Thanks for coming on, appreciate it. Thank you, John. Okay, we're here at EMC World, and uh, we're in Las Vegas. Uh, SAIC, Dave, is uh, known for inventing